$25,000. This is how much you would have today if you have invested only $1,000 10 years ago in Amazon. 
The company oh, is Ben Fittish from Sousa <laughs> Okay, I think we might need to stop now. Oh. Oh. and we're so happy you could join us online um, next week we hope to start yes it's uh, end of lockdown we are know we're in level three but we were in level three before lockdown so we'll be resuming back to 10 o'clock service and 11 30 service uh, as we did before uh, you've recently received a letter asking for a sponsorship for chickens if you are wanting to join in with that sponsorship that would be absolutely amazing we want to put a chicken in everybody's hamper for christmas uh, in food van so if you could bring that money with you or tell us when you come next week um if you're going to join in with us then we can order um and we know what we're going to do but we're going to go by faith as well we believe god's going to answer our prayers so we're going to have two songs right now. Uh, the first song we'll know. The second one we want, Alan's asked us to play this. So it's a request from Alan Tufner. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Surrounds me. 
Brilliant. Uh, we've had a message while we've been on. Uh, this is the good thing about uh, technology. Um, Leslie wanted to say that she sent off £120.62 for every life. Um, you know, that's, that's what we, we've supported for many, many years. So thank you everyone who sent in the money to Leslie. What we're going to do now, um, I'm going to mention that we've had some birthdays. Yesterday was Sylvia's and today is Natalie's, that's Angela's daughter, Angela Shams. So we're going to sing happy birthday and then I'm going to light the candle for Advent. Okay, so you're getting a double whammy here for <laughs> birthday peoples. Okay, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sylvia and Natalie. Happy birthday to you. Okay, so Dave, we're going to light the candle now. It's the first Sunday in Advent, believe it or not. It's, cro it's crept up on me. When Dave told me this, I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to light the first candle of Advent. So we've got this Sunday and three more Sundays before that Christmas Day. So we're going to have uh, one song now. Um, and then we're going to have, no, sorry, we're going to have our prayer scapes now. If Dawn can put prayer scapes up for us, please, and then we'll have our song. Thank you, Dawn.
in brokenness and celebrate differences. Yes, and where their feet tread, their hearts engage, all their voices ring out, golden kingdom threads are laid, threads that mend, threads that gather, threads that change, threads that lead others into the hope of eternity. God's children, his sons and daughters weave royal threads of kingdom family, reflecting the majesty of the Creator, heavenly and stunning and utterly indestructible.
To uh, this, what we come to there to, to read the Bible, which we believe is God's word, um, and we just want to just we've had a couple of people uh, writing in online <clears throat> and sharing things with us, uh, and we've we've picked up some some things threads from our community, and we're just going to just pray. Um, Uh, Joan, Joan McIver uh, uh, and her family have been looking after a, a lovely gentleman called Graham uh, for some time. Uh, we've never met Graham, but we do know Graham through Joan. I think that's the best way we can put that. And it seems that uh, uh, blessing Graham and Alzheimer's and it, he passed away yesterday. And uh, it seems that Jeff Ellis, some of us remember Jeff, uh, as the minister of uh, New Lane Baptist just up the road from us here. And it seems that uh, Jeff died on Monday. Well, Lord, Father, we just want to pray this morning. Uh, remember with John, uh, we remember Graham and we remember Graham's family this morning. We ask you to release to them and to the family of Jeff Ellis, Lord, you a peace. Father, we ask you to release you a you are compassionate presence at this time of loss. We ask you to bind up, bind up, to begin to bind up even now, Lord, the, the wounds of losing someone up there, Lord. I will commit these families to you, Lord. And we ask that you would continue to uh, presence yourself to them in the days that lie ahead. And we we ask, Lord, this morning, we ask for our community. We, we want to say that if we at Union Lord have received anything of your favour, Lord God, anything of your goodness, anything of your blessing, Lord, we want to, you give us authority, Lord, you give us authority to release that, release it over our community, and we release blessing, we release hope, Lord, we release forgiveness, we release Community renewal, Lord. Father, because we we continue to be in touch with uh, with people, and uh, Father, we want to thank you for the, for the faithful people who still serve in our community in all kinds of ways. Uh, Lord, the district nurses, the uh, community carers, Father, the 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 ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in our chemists, Lord, and the drivers who support us, and Father, our surgeries, and they don't often complain to us, but, but we do understand that they have been under great strain and stress, Lord, and we ask you to release your life and your love and your security 
all of these people, Lord. And we ask that this morning, Lord, regardless of whether they share our particular view of faith or not, we ask you to do this because we believe that you're a great and compassionate God. We believe there is the heart, your heart, that beats at the heart of our universe, Lord, and it beats with love for us. We pray, Father, that you just pour out your blessing over our town right now and over our country, Lord. Pray that we heal, heal the social division and wounds that seem to be rising up so easily amongst us. Lord, will you at this time, will you at this time empower us as a church, empower your whole church across the country, Lord, to be who you want us to be, to carry your name and your life more worthily. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're just picking up uh, again from, from last week. We were sharing <clears throat> from the first part of the Bible, which we call our Old Testament. And uh, we were reading from the book of Numbers. So, it's, so that's the fourth book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book in the Old Testament, chapter 10. If you've got your Bible, it's chapter 10. And... Uh, this is the thing about uh, God asking uh, Moses uh, to, to, to get the craftsmen to make two trumpets of hammered silver. He says, so the Lord says to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver, use them for calling the community together, for having the camps to set out. Now when both the trumpets are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. If only one is sounded, then the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. And when a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. And at the sound of a second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. And the blast will be the signal for setting out. So you gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the same signal for setting out. Now it's the sons of Aaron, the priests who are to blow the trumpets. And this is to be a lasting ordinance for you and your generations to come when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you. Sound the blast on this trumpet, on these trumpets. You will be remembered by the Lord your God. You will be rescued from your enemies. Also, you were times of rejoicing, uh, your appointed festivals uh, and your new moon feasts. You are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings and there will be a memorial for you before you are God, for I am the Lord you are God. And then just reading on for a couple of verses. On the 20th day of the second month, the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law and the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and they travelled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. Father, bless this word to us now, we ask uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, just, uh, just recently, um, uh, some of you will know uh, that um, uh, some of us in the leadership team, uh, we've been going through a development course uh, called ESOM. Uh, through our friends in Ireland, Causeway Coast Vineyard, what a great setup that is. Um, and uh, uh, the other week we heard this lovely uh, lady uh, called Carrie Lloyd uh, speaking to us. She was in America, but they, they kind of were zooming her in uh, through the technology. And this is Carrie's book, Dale, uh, Dale try and focus in on it for you. It's called The Noble Renaissance. I haven't finished it, but I do want to say I've started to read it, and I, I do think this with Alan Hirsch's Read Jesus is probably uh, going to be one of my books of the year this year. This is a fantastic book uh, to, to, to help us grow together uh, in our life in Jesus. 
Nobel Renaissance, Carrie Lloyd. Um, I want to talk this morning, just picking up from the theme of, of last week, and uh, Angie's going to make the um, PowerPoint zip up here. This, uh, this guy is a guy called Miles Davis. He's me and Dave's favourite jazz trumpeter. And uh, Miles once said, it's not about standing still and becoming safe. If anybody wants to keep creating, they have to be about changing. And in a sense, there is a sense in which the, the passage, it doesn't initially sound like it today, but the passage that we're reading together is about change. It's about change because it's telling us that our God connection life is a journey. Now all of life is a journey from the tomb of the womb as they say to the womb of the tomb. The only certainty we know as human beings is that it will end. Certainly we found in this uh, time of COVID-19 that, that, you know, that has brought that home to us again, to our society in, in a very, very strong way. But this journey is also about destiny and destination. And if you notice, in the passage we read together, there are two references to a thing called wilderness. And in the Bible passage, wilderness, and our experience of COVID-19, what these things do is they begin to ask us as people what our identity and our security and our destiny are rooted in. Are they rooted in our job, or our family, or our social position, our money and possessions, or the lack of? Because if our identity is centered in those things, and those things can be taken and lost, then, then our identity is lost with them. And this, this business of journeying, this, this business of taking a life journey in connection with God through, through faith in simple faith, trust in Jesus, raises the big question for us, where do we derive, where do we as human beings derive or develop an identity that cannot be lost and cannot be taken from us? And I believe that right here in this passage we've read in Numbers 10, there is a point there. Now it begins with, the quotation, this might seem to people a funny place to talk about human identity. The Lord says to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver. You notice what we're picking up here is that the trumpets are a God-given thing that Moses and, and the priests are to use to call the people to journey together. It's a God-given thing that marks their identity. It represents this God connection, what we call Jesus life identity. And what this Bible passage is telling us that God, the creator of heaven and earth, chooses them and us as his, we learned last week, kingdom of priests people. He lives among them as the center and purpose of their identity and their lives. And this is a sure place for us to grow in Jesus, our sense of who we are and what we are here for because as we see through this passage, God is faithful. As we read through this book, God is faithful to his promises. He unfailingly is giving direction and big vision. He's constantly showing where he is taking us as his people and what it will take for us to get there. He is constantly showing us the character qualities he wants to develop in and call from us so that we can learn in the old language we used to use occasionally to walk God's way. Now let me say just very quickly for folk who are watching in, you know, some of us come from a lot of Bible and knowledge backgrounds, some of us come from none at all. But in the Bible, sometimes walk, that word walk almost has inverted commas on it. It isn't I'm going for her. To walk in the Bible is a life path, it's about a life share. It, it's about us as human beings having such a God connection that our whole lives, our whole identities are caught up in him and are derived from him and the way that we live 
our life. So it's about a whole shape to the way that we live our life. Now, let me say that this passage is showing us it is a great privilege to be God-connected and God-called. It's a tremendous privilege to be called a kingdom of priests, people. But when God calls us that, he also sends his Holy Spirit to ask of us that we live out that identity with him. Now you see, as we work through these passages and we read these things in this book of the Bible, God walking is not just with our feet into his life or into these wilderness places, which incidentally are always places of testing and learning and growing and, and applying. But God also wants us, as it were, to walk with our mouths in worship. He wants us to walk with our hands in service. He wants us to walk with our whole lives as his witnesses to other people. It's great that God says, as he did toward the end of that passage, right together, remember I am your God. You are my people. It's great. But if God's life is in our life, his expectation is it's going to show out. Now part of this uh, story journey here in the Bible is that they, these people, you notice they move from the Sinai wilderness to the Paran wilderness. They're, they're on their way to, to the promised land. It's great to be promised land people, but promised land people are very different from being slave people. And as we read through the story of this book, God rescues Israel out of Egypt, but sadly, Egypt doesn't always come out to the people. And God is trying to say to them, as he's trying to say to us, a slave mentality is not for the promised land. You see, to walk with God, this God walking, is being transformed into promised land people. It's about a pilgrimage with God. And our God is personal, he's characterful, he's powerful, he's compassionate. He's, he's committed to his purposes and his people. To use a modern word, God is interventionist. As you read through these books of the Bible, you will see that God sees and he speaks and he saves and he signs. And he does that into the everyday. Now we pick that up in the book of Numbers. You notice that there's the constant repetition. Now the Lord spoke or commanded Moses. So it starts with, with the business of the Israelites walking. When to walk, when to stop walking. When to come, where to come. Just where to set up the tabernacle, the, the, the big tent of meeting. Who does what and when. It's about life purity and marriage issues. It's about jealousy and unfaithfulness. It's about sickness and social rightness. It's about making right and set apartness to God for specific times of work, spiritual restoration, at one man with God, healing, blessing, remembering. We have, we have instructions about celebrating the Passover because it's about memory. Remember that you're God's people. Remember what he's done for you. Remember that he has brought you into this connection with himself. And we notice that our God is mobile. He gives us these signs of the cloud and the pillar of fire. His personal presence, the ark, the cloud, the fire, the pillar, he travels ahead of and with his people. In other words, God is the basis of our identity. Our connection and relationship with the living God is the basis of our identity. We are chosen, chosen to be a kingdom of priests. Now, at the risk of something slightly technical for a moment, you notice that in these passages, God is someone before he does something. I am the Lord who, 
You notice that that phrase, if you read through the book of Numbers, you notice time and again that phrase recurring. I am the Lord who does this, or I am the Lord who shows that. You see, he is before he does. So security, promises, provision, protection, destiny, destination, and in exclusive inclusion. God reminds Israel, I call the aliens to myself, he says. In Numbers 11, there is a story about Holy Spirit power coming on people, about prophetic insight and leadership. This God is definitely, to use the old word, he is definitely a saviour. He rescues and he goes on rescuing us, but he's not safe. And neither is walking with or into his life. It means we are going to experience change and transformation. And we're not going to do that by our own abilities or power or mental cleverness or intellectual clout. We are going to do this. That's why the Bible uses, keeps on using that word, but walking with God. So this, this passage is uncovering that our identity is shaped and developed, that this journey, this pilgrimage, if you like, that we're all on is walking, is really meant to be about walking with and learning from God. Now, now that's not just in the ideas, or to use the old-fashioned word, the big doctrines of the Bible. They are important things, but it's also about our experience and our expression. You see, pilgrims are shaped by and they become loyal to God's promised future. Now, of course, in the book of Numbers, that promised future is the journey from Egypt to the promised land, arriving in the promised land. For us, as, as, as believers with the whole Bible now, with Jesus as well as the Father and the Holy Spirit, God's promised future is about a new heaven and a new earth. It's about creation, a creation filled with righteousness, healing, wholeness, community, life. The big Bible word for that is salvation. And, and, and our life and our loyalty, our walk with is being shaped all the time by God's future values. Now, now the Bible has got a phrase to describe all that. It's called the kingdom of God. Okay, it's about God ruling. And God's rule is, to use a modern phrase, a new world order. And what God is trying to teach the people here, and what he's trying to teach us currently, I believe, is you can't live in a new world order with old world order attitudes. It just doesn't work. You, you can't cross over into a new life, a new world order life with old world order values and attitudes. So God's values, God's values will impact upon us. They are here to reshape us to really live God's future life now. To grow and become the people he has made and called us to be. Uh, what would that look like? Well, let's start first with, with a negative. It, it, it isn't about being self-absorbed. Not self-absorbed where only my outlook, my wants, my needs dictate. Where only me and my matter. Where we use everyday language. It's like we get locked in ourselves and our desires and devices. And these things... That kind of self-absorption signals our broken God connection, that our connection with God is broken. That's what the Bible calls sin. It's a broken connection with the God who made us. And after that come all the behaviours and attitudes and that, that, that are so destructive to, to, to life. Neither can we withdraw into a God bubble where keeping ourselves clean from the world means 
We, we ignore our little cities, poverty-stretched people. And there are poverty-stretched people in our community, and we're finding them all the time. And not all of them are scrungers. Some may be, but not all of them. Neither are they sometimes people who, well, they need to learn to manage better. Oh, well, let me say, you know, I'm grateful for the fact, and I'm sure others of us are, that, that our parents help us to learn and budget with money properly. All of those things are useful. What I'm talking about now is what's called new poverty. Let me define it for you. Where 18% of children live in a home where someone in the house goes without meals for at least two days a week so that the kids can be fed. Where they have no basic toiletries, where they're unable to light and heat the house. It's new poverty because two out of three of those families have one or two people in work. But the work is often in basic wage or zero hour contracts. Things that are sometimes, people might think it's very harsh me saying this, sometimes touched by shady employment practices which suits nothing but the labour and the economic market. I say, well, what's that got to do with us? Well, you see, even if we confine our God walk into church or to our personal life, God's new future values and attitudes are forgiveness, restoration, healing, kindness, compassion, and allness, all the kind of things we've been singing and celebrating about in all our videos this morning. And Jesus says, those values must mark us. Now, all of us, me included, we, we need to be careful. When we claim that we are God or Jesus connected people, worshipping people, we need to be sure that our lives actually do show out those values. Which is a roundabout way of me asking, are all of us, are we? Are we, if we claim to be God's people, claim to be connected to Jesus by trust, are we pilgrims in character? Is God's Holy Spirit reshaping me and us in a Jesus-shaped character expression? Well, what, what, would, what would such a thing look like? Oh, that sounds a bit a bit. Airy fairy, Brother Honor. Well, let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like Jesus and the church in Acts. That's what it looks like. That there is a depth and an excellence of empowered and embedded living that calls other men and women and young people into God's future. It gives sight to the physically and spiritually blind. Sometimes it uses spit and mud as little tools along the way with that. It brings fear into the deaf, strength to the weak and weary. Let's face it, that's nearly all of us in COVID land now, isn't it? It makes the lame walk. It even identifies with brokenness, self-caused life damage, bringing renewal, offering us a way out of our self-built prisons. Take the prison of self-delusion. You know, I think all of us from time to time are guilty of thinking that we're better than we are because we want some God-given growth or improvement, you know. Now, this isn't to, to do us down, but, you know, as we walk with God, they become, they become matters of choices tomorrow. Will I show forgiveness? Will I show compassion? Will I show wholeness and healing? Or will I show pride or envy or anger? Will I show behavior that lashes out at others because my own pain or our own pain and spitefulness and selfishness makes us and our wants and needs the universe's center and our edge? Which once again shows how broken is our God connection which is the essence of our human sin. Or is my character 
or is our character together so Jesus in power it can cut through our small city's divisions of race, gender, sexuality, economy, social standing, and let me be blunt about it, prejudice. Now what is prejudice? Well, Martin Luther King, that great warrior of the civil rights movement, defined prejudice like this. He said, it is the human need to have someone to look down on so that I feel better about myself. And these things stare at us weakly. I believe that as a community, God is calling and recalling and wants to renew in us a Jesus-inspired character that invades life with courageous and outrageous acts of wild kindness. Hint, hint, sponsor a chicken. <laughs> Longing to introduce others into their real God-formed identity, helping us to stand out in his Holy Spirit's power. David, give me a smile here, everyone. Everywhere. Everywhere. Every, every day. day. And why are we doing that? Well, not just for ourselves, but for others and for God's future. Now we are learning in the Holy Spirit together to show honest, grippy lives of integrity and truth. Now let me be honest, this Christ life is, is a faith journey. It's about lifelong learning. It's about leaning into change and adaption. It brings creative tension as a risk of oversimplifying. Often in this God connection life, people are pilgrims or the settlers. Now pilgrims, of course, pilgrims often enjoy challenges of change, new insights, new settings. They push beyond the present frontiers of where the church is. They struggle with maintaining just what's established. They get bored if they're acting too long with the same things. They seem able to adapt and make good, quick decisions to develop new teams. Settler people often want to cultivate and grow what is planted. They want to develop and conserve and strengthen what's started. They, they sometimes need to see all the details and the outcomes. They, they need big preparation before they act. They find change situations frankly hairy and uncomfortable. They include and develop others in and along so that they can hold the ground that they have. And let me make it clear, life in Jesus needs both types of people. Willingness to go into our changing world, clear about God's message and mission and method. One of which, of course, is the building of a faith community. Where people can find their place and identity. Now, of course, people are very quick to remind me that the, the essence of the gospel never changes, but the language and the styles that we need to adapt to the new generation and the culture situations we call they do, they do need to change. And Jesus-like challenges are about recognizing who and which we are, because sometimes God calls pioneers into a settling phase. Sometimes he calls settlers into a pilgrim phase. Well, why would he do that? Well, so that we begin to learn all the aspects of both sides of what is needful so that we can adapt for the sake of the king's mission. We're on pilgrimage, not just with God, but with each other. We're on pilgrimage, let me say again, not just with God, but with each other. Now, it's true that in this pilgrimage, everyone matters. But we also journey together. And we journey through real life tensions. The truth is about us as human beings, we can often get stuck in stuff. Situations or patterns. So stuck we stop seeing that we're stuck. And then we begin to blow up at people who expose it. Why is God? Why has God let COVID-19 go on? Now, I'm trying to be careful with this, and I'm trying to be compassionate. But you see, the point about being in wilderness, both for Israel, for Jesus, yes, 
But Jesus, when he went in, and for us, is about a testing time. It's about finding out about ourselves and our faith community, who and how we really are. What is it that really makes us tick? What really matters to us? Not what we say or sometimes think matters. We begin to learn if we are performing God connection life or if we are living it. Wilderness shows us life issues and stuff that often, if we're honest as human beings, we deeply deny. It makes us look hard at what life is all about. It brings me to understand that sometimes, to my shame, I think it is shallow, and so is my believing and my living. But most of all, in wilderness, we begin to learn what our God connection life is really like. God walking with us, us walking with him. In the end, the simplest truth about meeting Jesus is this. We cannot meet him and he cannot impact us for us just to stay the same. In fact, if that is what is happening, we, we really need to look at our connection. Now this morning, God calls us again to learn to walk with him in a new situation and to find the truth of what his people have always felt that God walks with us and as he does others are drawn into his life and into his life in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen
Okay, uh, I just before we come to our last prayer, I just want to point out these lovely flowers. Dave's going to point them. Aren't they beautiful? This is our Christmas flower decoration, which Alison came on Friday and done. And uh, you must say, it's looking absolutely gorgeous. Um, let's just say the prayer. Okay. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And can I just say as well, but if you're not, the song we just sang, if you're not part of our family, or that you believe in Jesus, please get in touch with us. We'd love to chat to you. And we'd love to give you Travelling Light, one of our uh, little uh, booklets that would help. So next week, let me just remind you, it's 10 o'clock here for the first service, 11.30 for the second third service. And please bring some envelopes with some cash in mm -hmm. saying chickens on the front. And that money's going to go towards getting some chickens. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye. Please.